Yay. Hey, everybody. Um, good morning. Hey, Sharon. Good morning. Good morning. Today we have in action, uh, we have a lot of content in today's episode. Hey, Jen. Hey, Heather. Hey, Tracy. Um, I know I've talked about this uh, before in the past. Good morning, Stacy, Wanda, Lydia, Jennifer, Melissa, one of our newest members um, in level two, Melissa. Good morning, Diane and Julie, level one members. <laughs> Let me see if I can get my co-host on here. There we go. So, hey, Sean, another member. Sandy, another member. <laughs> We have a lot of members. Um, welcome to another episode of Coffee with the Critters. For those that uh, may not know me, my name is Laura Joseph. I am owner of the Animal Behavior Center here with my umbrella cockatoo, Rico, my weekly co-host on his station. Um, we're an international educational center teaching people all over the world about living, loving, and learning with animals <clears throat> through the science of behavior and applied behavior analysis uh, and positive reinforcement. And we offer that content um, to our those that are subscribed to our memberships and our projects. And we do that weekly in detail. Um, so yeah, good morning, everybody. Um, hey, Ashley. Hey, Amanda. More members. <laughs> our membership um, list is growing. So um, as we get started, for anybody that's interested, uh, let me pull up my agenda and how would I do that? Where would I find that? Um, for the, anybody that's interested, if you want to find out more information about us, you can find it at our website, theanimalbehaviorcenter.com. Um, so yeah, like I was saying, I have probably talked about preparing your animal for the veterinary exam before, but um, I have different content for you this time, and I'm trying to show um, a wide variety of things that we can do, what we do, how we do it, why we do it. Right, Rico? Right, Quincy? So we're joined this morning with all of our parrots and our deaf dog, Levi, and Quincy. I pick out people, or I pick out animals on purpose, don't I? Can come up here? Hi. <laughs> to who's going to be the best, the best candidates to help me do some live stream training for you guys. Yay. Good morning. Um, so this is Quincy, our four and a half year old Rottweiler, who will be going to the vet in about two weeks, soon followed by Snow, our deaf and blind border collie. Good morning, Sarah. Hey, everybody. Hey, Jeannie. I guess I'm just going to do a live stream with my lap dog. <laughs> they love it, and they know when I'm getting ready to do coffee with the critters. Right, Rico? Nice job. Nice job. Thank you. <laughs> we, we need to keep live streaming. <laughs> um, hi, Booger. Yay. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so thank you everybody for joining once again um, feel free to share this episode with those that you think will help uh, how, hey Amy good morning how many people here get stressed when they know it's time to take their animal to the vet Um, hey, Jill, does anybody here um, get stressed when it's time to take their animal to the vet? Um, a lot of people do. And don't forget to, if you don't want to miss a live stream, don't forget to turn on the notifications, share this episode if you think this will help with people, um, and turn on your C first, so that way when we go live, you're notified immediately. So Jovan says that they get um, nervous or anxious when it's time to take their animal to the vet. Um, and don't forget, I now have the option to bring you online with me if anybody wants to come online. Hey, Melinda. So she says she's a registered vet 
tech and she does. <laughs> well, hopefully, Melinda, this will help you. Um, <clears throat> so one of the, I train a wide variety of animals. And the, the reason I train so many different animals is because of the power in the message. I like, I love training exotics. Anything from parrots um, to different zoo animals. And I, walk, I work with a lot of different zoo animals and I do that on purpose. They, great, they, they are great um, education ambassadors. So I can easily show you how you can train something with a dog, but then I wanna turn around and say, uh, show you how you do it with a parrot how you do it with a giraffe, how you train it with a lemur. And we've got a lot of that um, <clears throat> in our episode today. Um, so um, got some adopted dogs, especially with your goffins. And we, when I bring in an animal, several things I first start training. One is I just observe the animal in its environment because I'm identifying what's, what's, potential reinforcers, what are potential aversives. I gather those lists of positive reinforcers and deliver them for behaviors I want to see maintain or increase. Let's get this off of here. Goodbye. Um, and then whatever are potential aversives, I need to read and understand that animal's body language and try to identify the aversives and remove them from the environment, but some, like just the presence of this could be an aversive. And if I see an animal run or fly from me, then I know this has past meaning and I need to counter condition, which means retrain, because we will train this, um, the acceptance of this with every animal in our care, because this may have to be someday. And don't wait until your animal is sick to start training because I am here to tell you um, that at that point, personally, on my personal experience, it can be too late. And that if the animal isn't trained to accept like um, an injection, a voluntary uh, jugular blood draw, um, or a radiograph, that can stress the animal even more when they are sick. Believe me, I have personal experience with that. And note to self, this needs training. So um, one of the things we do every week, where I'm starting to do every week, good morning today, we're joined with Milo, um, is I like to share the progress that the volunteers have done throughout the week. A lot of pe people that join our live streams want to see what the volunteers are doing, how they're doing it, why they're doing it. Yeah, see you later. I think I just confused them. <laughs> yeah, see you later. Cock a doodle doo. It's kind of a mixture of all that. Peek a boo. So let me share with you real quick some of the things we're working on here. Bring this back up into the broadcast. Um, so this was a picture I took yesterday of, yeah, Willie, uh, the education turkey vulture here from Nature's Nursery, watching us work while we were in our cage yesterday. Yeah, watching me and Crystal and Christine work on enrichment, and um, this is what we were working on. We have an upcoming first ever um, animal enrichment workshop all species and work, workshop. Uh, we can go into detail towards the end of the episode. Um, but yeah, we're having a two day enrichment workshop, very in depth, in detail, well thought out, how enrichment affects behavior with lectures and a bunch of hands on. Oh, that's so funny, Rock. So, um, <laughs> this week, um, I was. Uh -huh. gave a presentation to the psychology department at Lourdes University, located here in Sylvania, Ohio. And I was very excited to bring that content because it's their human, um, I think the class was called human learning. Um, and my approach in applied behavior analysis and how this works with 
animals because it helps drive home the message. Um, here's Crystal, our social media director, continuing to um, develop a relationship with Rocky, our 20 year old uh, Moluccan cockatoo we got from a shelter years ago. Um, talk about a lot of counter conditioning. That's what was uh, what we had to do with Rocky, retraining a lot of different things. Um, our photos this morning, just on our work here at the center, is kind of bird heavy this morning, but definitely not limited to. Here's Coco, the 28-plus-year-old um, umbrella cockatoo that came to us from a zoo. And um, he was once stated that he was afraid of sticks. And I was like, be specific. He's afraid of sticks if people's hands are attached to those sticks. So um, he was afraid of brooms, and he still is. We're still working on several different things, but this target stick is probably about two feet long, and I had to train him. I had to counter condition his experience um, with just seeing the target stick. Okay, so there he is. We trained him to accept it and target to it, and that it is a. So now, when he sees the target stick comes out, he goes over to his station, ready to be trained. So it is no longer an aversive. Um, I'm going to upload a video sometime today. Uh, we were working on different enrichment yesterday, <clears throat> and in the parrot project, we're going really heavy into. Um, teaching our birds to forage. So yesterday we were in there working in the training room and I was like, why do we not have more complex foraging toys for cello or roller pigeon? Um, so I'll upload that video where we started. Uh, we did a live stream yesterday in the Parrot Project showing how to make that more complex in identifying potential punishers and aversives. Um, I am getting ready to take off to Canab, Utah, in the middle of April, um, the Pet Professional Guild is putting on um, a two-day workshop, or not, not two-day, it's several days, a week-long workshop on um, training different animals. They're hiring or bringing in, flying in different professional trainers from all over the world, um, and I will be the one in uh, doing the presentations representing parrots in the workshops with parrots out at Best Friends, very excited. So this is one of my two talks, The Evolution of Aviculture. Um, and the second one, my deadline is Tuesday to have these submitted. The second one is fine tuning our training skills with our parrots. Um, so if I have not been um, very active on Facebook lately, that is why, <laughs> because I am on a deadline to get those two presentations done before I head to Key West. Okay, so let's get back into our topic um, of where did we begin in, in training our animals for the veterinary exam. <clears throat> if you have the luxury of working with an animal Hey, Allison, if you have the luxury of working with an animal, I need to get Rico on screen here, from a very young age, um, don't waste that time. Hey, there's Nancy. We'll be live streaming with Nancy Forrester right here, not right here. I will be in Key West in less than two weeks, and we'll be live streaming with Nancy Forrester down there. Very excited for those that have been following um, Nancy's work. So see you in a couple weeks, Nancy. So many times, um, people wait for people wait for undesired behaviors to show before they start working with an animal. If I can't get to an animal soon enough to start training, because training using positive reinforcement and applied behavior analysis is. the best form of communication I have found with any animal. And like you hear me say, if that animal can see, hear, smell, or feel you, you are training it whether you realize it or not. Training is teaching. Training is teaching. 
Teaching is learning. Learning is communication. What are we training? <laughs> Look at these two at my feet. I'm going to do some live stream training here in a little bit, but I have a lot of slides I can show you that can really help with where I'm going. Um, you know, there's that term, the terrible twos. That is a term I wish would just go away because it's a, it's a label that puts behavior in a fishbowl, meaning once it's in the fishbowl, it um, tends, people tend to think that they can't do anything about it. Yes, you can. Yes, you can. So, like I said, I can't get to an animal soon enough um, because it's already learning. And that label, the terrible twos, that animal is learning. And it's learning to, if you want to call it misbehave, if it's behaviors you don't want it doing, but the animal is learning through experience different things that bring positive consequences for that animal. And once once you learn that two plus two equals four, you can't under you can't undo it. So before the animal even sh starts showing the undesired behavior, that's why I'm always watching, aren't I, Quincy? I'm always watching. Huh. Yes. Come on. <laughs> um, I'm always watching behavior. Okay, Levi's up too. Okay, I got about a total of 200 pounds on my lap right now. <laughs> um, so I don't mind if my dogs jump. I just, when I ask them to, right? Do you want to come up? Come on. Bulldog. <laughs> just if, if I ask them to. Okay. Um, yeah. Okay. Nice job. Um, so with that term, the terrible twos, that animal is learning and people um, push off undesired behavior onto that label, the terrible twos, because it, that way they're not responsible for it. Uh, yes, you are. <laughs> If that animal is in our care, that is our responsibility. Um, but that's the core mission behind what we do here. Um, Sarah says, take a question. What would you consider a young parrot? I know my own parrot is turning a year in May and is still young, but what do you consider young? That is a good question. And I would say young is anything under 10. <laughs> um, I don't think we have we have one parrot here under the age of 10 but Sarah the key is go ahead and start training I don't wait for undesired behaviors to show so a young dog a young um, a young anything a young parrot start training at things that are going to set it up for success studies show that if you're actually using positive reinforcement training it's the animals preferred form of enrichment we're all about empowering animals here And that is the only reason I train, because the positive um, reinforcement from the training seems to be such a valued factor in any animal's life that I've interacted with. Um, it creates really strong relationships with the trainer, which is key. When I first start training an animal, I'm the only one training that behavior. What's that, Rico? You can do a somersault? Well, go ahead. Let's get it out of your system. Go ahead. You can do a somersault. Are you going to put your wings on? Do a somersault. Ready? Do a somersault. One, two, three. Yes. Whoa. Whatever. Okay, that's new. We'll take that. Look at you. Look at you. Yes. Yes. Good job, Rico. I'm going to take that. That's new. What are you? I've got to reinforce that. Hang on. I'm going to reinforce with proximity. Nice job. Yeah. That was pretty good. Yes. That was good. You want to do it again? You do? Do it. Okay. We'll do it for one second. Next class, let's see. Got to show off for the camera. Um, go ahead and start training those animals anything that would set them up for success. I've got several different tools here that we're going to use some training today and show you. Um, many people wait for the undesired behavior um, to be exhibited. <clears throat> um, 
And then, hey, Mark, see on here. Um, many people wait for the undesired behavior to be exhibited. Um, it can only take one time for that animal to learn that that undesired behavior, undesired by us, brings a positive consequence to the animal. Um, so a lot of what we do around here is because we have a wide uh, variety of animals, I am always training for grooming, husbandry, vet prep, because that stuff always has to happen. If I have spare time, then I move into focus and control exercises. Pay attention to me. Um, I like to train during distractions. That's a behavior that we shape. And um, that's the reason behind this photo. <clears throat> if Let me make this a little larger. If you can tell what's going on in this photo, don't pay attention that it's a bird. Pay attention that it's an animal. And what am I doing? I am training that animal to stay calm and on my hand while the greenhouse, the center, is being mowed. So it's a loud noise. It's a big object. It's a new person. Um, and then you reinforce that in small approximations. I always tell people, keep your animal used to change. And we always shape distractions, shape change. We're going to show in the parrot project and I can show in the pig project and the memberships this week the importance behind teaching your animal one, two, three. Something is going to happen on three. You don't know what it is, but it's going to be something new and it's going to be paired with the positive. That's a way for us to keep our animals used to change. Um, I used to do it all the time with the parrots and I've started doing it with the dogs and the pig. Um, yeah, so keep them used to change and like I said, I will also teach them focus and control exercises. This is Levi, our deaf dog in the background and Snow, our deaf and blind border collie in the foreground. They are here because I love them, but they, <clears throat> They are also here because they are great ambassadors for the educational society to show people um, how applied behavior analysis works across the board. How do you communicate with a deaf dog? Um, I guarantee you prim the, his primary attention is attention. Um, so I always reinforce eye contact with deaf animals. So hi, so then we have Snow, our deaf and blind puppy. How do you train a deaf and blind puppy with all the senses that they do have? Nice job, Rupa, nice job, okay? So with Snow, we prepare her for the veterinary exam. Um, and here I'm doing a focus and control exercise with both of them. I'm asking them to go into a down position until I cue them to do otherwise. So you can tell by Snow's ears, Snow's ears, she is paying attention. She is searching for information, and I am there to bridge and reinforce um, the stay still until I ask you to do otherwise. Um, put me back in broadcast. I meant to pull the pictures out. So does that make sense? And where I start with an animal is I always start with calm. I may take something that could be an aversive, like this, and show it at a distance, or I may just pick it up and see so I'm watching how the animal reacts, and then I'll set it back down. So, if Rico, you come over to your station, we can do some syringe training. Yeah, I really mean it. He's like, me? Really? You call me on deck? Come on over. Come here. Um, I'll wait till he gets back up on the stage. So um, it's easy for me to get ahead of myself because I want to talk about everything. But um, before I get started with some training and showing how we train different things, um, so the stress, let's see, the stress we see our animals under at the vet visit can actually punish our behavior of taking the animal to the vet. 
um, and the vet visits before we consult with anybody here, whether it's uh, most of our consultations are all live streams. Um, I will ask about the medical history of the animal. Has the animal been to see the vet? Because you can pay me for this consultation, but if we have not ruled out that this is a medical issue, um, then your money is, it, it, and if it is a medical issue, then your money is going to waste. Um, so another thing that I do, you'll see the slides coming up, the different animals I take to the vet and train for the vet. It, 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 it can be fun for you if that animal really enjoys going to the vet and associates it all with positive experiences. Um, that's going to make me want to take, yeah, uh, our six month exam is due, let's go. We're trained and it's a way for me to show people your animal can do this too. My, um, the photo I have on my personal Facebook page, which is me going like this, and Rico's sitting right here, um, Rico Squico, the umbrella cockatoo, um, the, the photographer says, wow, we have a lot of people bring their dogs in here and we wish they were this well behaved. So Rico was perching on my shoulder and here for the photo shoot and I was bridging and reinforcing because has he ever been in a photo shoot before? No, and he's got flashes going off behind us and in front of us. Um, and I was able to keep him on my hand the whole time. So another thing is um, a lot of, hi. Many times, and there's a future episode I'm going to do on what I look for when I choose a veterinarian. Um, I train my animals for the vet visit. When I walk into the vet, I tell them, my animals are trained for all of this. And um, that's when they're more likely to say, okay, you know, we need to do this, this, and this, and I'll ask the animal to get ready. And I'm going to show you a couple of different things that we train. Um, a lot of times when we take our animals to the vet, you'll see them shut down. I shut down meaning just they know that no matter what they do, they have, thanks Carol, they have no control over the consequence, so they just shut down. That doesn't have to be. This can be a very positive experience for your animal. Um, also, if your animal's stressed at the vet visit, it can turn into stress and anxiety and the animal not knowing, the unpredictable at home, causing a lot of uh, behavior issues. Veterinarians don't necessarily, well, don't have the time to train your animal to accept whatever is whatever procedures are going to be done. That's our responsibility, and we can make this fun, and it doesn't have to be long. And so many times I hear people say, you have so much patience, and I'm like, no, really, I don't. <laughs> I'm not necessarily a patient person. I am not. <laughs> when I want something, I want it done now. Um, <clears throat> I love to train using this. The people that say you have to have so much patience to use positive reinforcement training are obviously probably taking too big of steps not looking at the small enough detail in behavior change. Um, so, and vets love it when animals are trained uh, because they know the exam is going to go smoothly and with as least stress possible. Um, like I said, I'm going to do a future episode on what I look for when picking out my veterinarians. We have several. Um, and, um, I work with my veterinarians. I work with each one of them. I will call them ahead of time. They all know me. They all know I train. And I'll say, okay, I need to make an appointment for this. What, how are you going to do these procedures so I know I can start the training right here? They appreciate that. And then in three weeks, four weeks, I'm in, boom, animals trained for these procedures. So ask your vet. Um, ask your vet. Do, you know, what are you going to do to this, to my animal when I bring it in? Um, <clears throat> so, 
Um, I see different people saying that their vet doesn't, the vet doesn't allow you in with your animal. Um, that is one thing I will ask, and we'll save that for a future episode. Um, we have several different veterinarians. One, um, Dr. Dr. Myers at um, Hartman Veterinary Clinic here in Toledo, um, he knows, oh, I'm coming back with my animals <laughs> because I can train this. This has been trained, and he knows, and we have a really good foundation together, and we respect each other's work, and he knows this is what I have to do, Laura. Um, would you like to come back with me? And I trust him 110 um, percent, but I'm always like, yeah, I would, because I want to watch. Even if I cannot touch the animal, I understand that you have to do what you have to do, but I need to watch stress levels, and if something wasn't trained, I'm watching the behavior of that animal, and I'll be note to self, this needs trained as soon as we get back to the center. I didn't see this one coming. Um, so, just trying to catch up. Um, so, I'll work with another one of my veterinarians, veterinarians, Dr. Uh, Tim Reichert. He's an awesome veterinarian, former Toledo Zoo vet, former San Diego Zoo vet. He comes and visits the center, and um, we have a good working relationship together. He knows, and he told me last time he was in, he was like, Laura, start training Milo the mini pig for a tusk inspection, because the next time I'm coming in, we're, we're examining those tusks. Cool. We've started, and it's fun. And we do live stream that in the pig project. Um, <clears throat> okay, so I'm going to show a couple of different um, photos here of things we train. Here's the awesome Julie Shipman. She is um, our vet tech. She's been our vet tech for several years. Um, she will come in and help me do um, different types of grooming procedures. Here she's helping me with um, Kronos, the African Pied Pro that was here from um, a zoo for training and then here she is um, helping me with Coco the 28 plus year old cockatoo so I will like Rico is trained to accept restraint he sees the towel come out he knows um, and he knows what it's going to do it was once an aversive because when I started working with Rico I didn't know I could train these things um, so I want to show you here we're um, restraining him for a nail trim, and this is the behavior immediately afterwards. <clears throat> I am reinforcing, um, carrying the consequence of restraint with as much positive as possible. It's always the animal that determines the reinforcer. Rocky's going to start screaming. Um, <clears throat> so I'm pairing it with as much positive as possible. It's always pick a what rock. It's always the animal that determines the reinforcer, not us. Um, and reinforcers are so much more than food. Like you see, attention proximity. Quincy's like, come on, let's try it. I'm gonna speed this up a little bit. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> So um, here's me training Puzzles the Giraffe to accept a hoof trim. Dr. Riker took me through the zoo and says, Laura, this animal needs trained this, this animal needs trained this, and I just start getting to work on it. Um, <clears throat> here's me working with Cash. Cash is uh, one of, um, his family is one of the only personal clients that I have here um, that we do show our live streaming with our dogs and level one. And so before I go too much further, um, I want to talk about, let's see, we train all the, the birds to let us have their, let us trim their nails and do wing inspections. Um, let's do some live stream training because I want to show you some stationing, how we um, prepare animals for the vet visit using a station. So a lot of times um, the surface in which an animal stands on at the veterinarian, whether it's the floor, the table, whatever is being done, if, 
and I know this from personal experience, like the pig's hooves will slide. If they start sliding on a metal table, <clears throat> that can be a one-time positive puncher. Um, that is an unpleasant experience that can actually punish the behavior in the progress I've made with Milo going to the vet. So this is why we shape a station. Let me show you some stationing here, and then I'll show you some photos, what we did, how we did it, why we did it. So Levi, training's getting ready to start. Let me move my table. You guys have seen me train stations before. And that orange square is a station. That's Milo's station. Um, it's always there. <clears throat> okay, so watch the cues. I stood up. The dogs are watching me. Well, now they are. Um, I know you guys have probably seen me train stations before. It's something I train every single animal. Um, including alligators, which you're going to see coming up. Um, but I'm going to show you after this how they come in very handy at the vet visit. So they're watching. Where are we going? Where are we going? Hey, dogs. Where Tells the animal where to go. That's going to hurt the reinforcement. It's giving information. Can you guys see this? Okay. Um, most of the time, if it's a mobile station, Coco, I will pull it. So it creates more contingency. It's a clear line of communication when that station goes back down. Do you guys have any questions about that? <clears throat> um, okay, so um, they see that station. That's called a condition reinforcer, meaning 
The only time they see that station is when it's paired with going and sitting on it, um, targeting their behinds to it. So then when I take them to the vet clinic, I pull out the station, clear line of communication. I need you to stay right here. And let me bring this back. And also those station mats, they don't slide on the table and the animals don't slide on them. Um, so here's us using a station to do a voluntary, a voluntary hoof trim with Milo. In the veterinary world, a lot of times um, in grooming, a lot of times there's a lot of force used with pigs. And pigs are prey animal. It can be very stressful. It can be very stressful even if no matter what the animal. Right, Rico? <clears throat> so train this. And um, here, a lot of times when pigs need their hooks trimmed, I'm not going to compete with that. Well, that's nice, Rocky. Peekaboo yourself. Peekaboo you. Yeah. Hey, you guys said you liked it better out here in the animal room than in my quiet office. Um, a lot of times with pigs, they have to put under anesthesia in order to have their clips trimmed. That can be very dangerous. And it doesn't need to be. You can train this. Ah, hi, hi. So let's go into some other things that we train. I want to show you. Um, we train every animal here for a nail trim, a hoof trim, body inspections. So obviously, here's Snow. She can't see what I'm doing, but I'm I'm asking her for her to stay stationed and pay attention to what I ask next. Um, so just the sight of the nail purse could be a punisher and causing the animal to run. Um, so I start introducing a lot of times it's counter conditioning here with these three dogs. I was able to get them as puppies, all three of them. So my work began immediately. Um, <clears throat> many of the birds you see behind me, they live a very long time. There's been a there's been several years of them learning undesired behaviors that I've had to counter condition, right, Levi? Um, so next slide. Uh, oh, syringe training. I think that's what I'm going into next. This is what animals coming from the zoo next, um, a couple of quadamundis. And um, it's not this particular one, but one of the first, you know, another thing I'll start training is to accept medication. And right now they're getting a bunch of goodies, but eventually I switch that into not so goody. Um, okay, here's where the station comes in handy for the vet clinic. This is Milo on one of his several stations. When I was at the check, when I was checking in, there's hay and all kinds of food in the front office. Milo's a pig. If I don't tell him what to do, he's going to go do something whether I like it or not. So I threw the station down next to my side. While we checked in, it told him where to go, and I made it much more um, reinforcing for him to stay by my side than go stick your nose in that big bag full of hay right next to us. And then, um, so that station is a clear line of communication, so when we went into the veterinary exam, where did I put it? Up on the table. Um, the veterinarian was like, no, I'll get down on the ground with the pig. And I was like, hey, he's trained to do this. You don't have to break your back. I don't want to break my back. That's why I train a lot of mammals up on tables. Um, because squatting for long periods of time, um, my hips hurt. I'm a former runner, and I have problems with my hips. Um, so squatting for long periods of time, I may not get up. <laughs> But that's knowing that I have to squat to train an animal will positively punish the behavior of me training that animal. I know. That is why I train animals to climb up ramps, get on tables. I can scoop my chair up right next to you, bam, and start the voluntary grooming. Um, so here's the awesome Dr. Reichert um, and uh, volunteer Sandy Pratt. We've got the station on the table. We've trained Levi, our deaf dog. Boom, up the table. And what I'm doing is 
squirting pate in his mouth as Dr. Riker is giving an ear inspection. Um, so Dr. Riker would look at me. He goes, okay, this is what we need to do next. And he just looks at me for do whatever you need to do to get the animal ready. So boom, and nice job. Reinforcing eye contact. Um, <clears throat> so here is Sandy and our former intern from Siena Heights College Psychology Department, Maddie Split. Um, like I was saying in the beginning, when I first start training an animal of particular behavior, I'm the only one training it. I will train that animal, that one particular behavior, until it's well-trained, and then it is so important to start introducing new people. Um, so this is what we're doing. I trained Milo to go to the scale, then I pass it off. Sandy, you start training it. Milo knows it very well. Let me watch the two of you because um, I may not be here to take Milo to the vet. You may have to. Um, once you introduce the vet and the vet techs, is that that animal may be well trained at home to do particular behaviors from me, but I'm not going to be the one sticking the thermometer, you know, where. <laughs> Are they going to be okay with somebody else sticking that thermometer there? So that's why we start incorporating different people doing training. Um, I was paying attention to your comments. Here's Lily and Cash that come here for training. We were live streaming this the other day in a level one, I believe. Um, both of these dogs come from a shelter. Lily ha is very fearful of anything, new experiences, new environments. She is skyrocketing with her training. She gets happy. Well, she gets excited. Her tail really wags. Now, when she comes to the center versus before. Ears were down, she was licking her lips, tail was tucked so far you didn't even know she had one. Um, so um, we train, what we're doing is we're much more advanced than this now, but um, training Lily to get up on a table because we need to trim her nails. Um, and we're training her to walk across the ramp. Why in the background is cash. We need animals to be okay being, except being crated while we're working other animals. Because a lot of times what you'll see is that's such a positive experience for the animal to be trained that the one that's being crated, it can cause a lot of anxiety um, because they want to be trained. So here we are reinforcing both of them in small increments. Um, Um, crate training. I crate a lot. I train a lot of different animals. Here's Molly, the lemur. Some of you guys may remember her being here with us. We trained her to go into a crate. Uh, Lindsay, and I'm going to get some photos of it this week, is going to start. Rico is our off contact. Well, he's one of several animals here that are we are uh, off contact training for the volunteers' safety. Nice job, Rock. Um, Lindsay is getting ready to start training Rico to go into a crate with no contact. So the end result, she can go in, shut the door, pick up the crate, move Rico where he needs to go. Um, we're going to start that training this week, so stay tuned. You will definitely be seeing that in the Parrot Project, and I believe she's coming in tomorrow. So anybody in here in the Parrot Project, you're going to want to pay attention to tomorrow's live stream. Um, we're going to show you how to do this. So here's Molly, willingly going into the crate. Door is open. She's not running out. Tickle wickle yourself. Here's uh, Mona, uh, Mona Benone, monkey. Complete off contract training with me. I, am, I don't want my fingers anywhere near her mouth. And those of you in tickle wickle, those of you in level two saw how I did all of that. She's on her station. I couldn't. I'm dropping Cheerios down that tube because I can't touch her. And um, I showed how I did all my crate training with her with ever, never having to have contact. Several of the animals that I train at zoos, I, don't, I can't have physical contact. Um, or sometimes I need to have protective contact. So here is um, Zoe, um, the pig that I train, preparing them for a medical exam. I can do another live, or I can do another, um, 
training session here real quick, but I really want to show the importance. She's on her station. I'm training a head tar target. When I put my hand on her head, I give the word hold, and that means just stay still. Something is getting ready to happen to you. You don't know where, but it's going to happen. And that's how I prepare her for the veterinary exam. Um, and that's all I'm doing is touching her in different areas of her body. This is I do the same thing. There's Quincy on a table on a mat that's not going to slip. And I'm just reinforcing stay calm. I'm getting ready to touch you all different places on your body. You may not know where, but it's going to be well worth your while. Um, you want to watch the off-contact crate training, Sharon. Um, Sharon, that it, that that those live streams are in our level two membership. Our level two membership is for professionals and for zookeepers, zoo trainers, um, and people who want to know just want more intense weekly live streams on training. Um, I think Melissa's in here. She's a, our new member this week. Then, um, okay. So do you train alligators? Absolutely. Yes, I do. And here was Dr. Reichert with me. Both of these animals are stationing. This is Priscilla on the left and Elvis on the right. Um, they were fascinating, fabulous educators to train. You're going to see me in level two and maybe some people in level um, one. I may do a live stream in there once in a while, but most people in level, level one aren't out training alligators. Um, level two. Possibly, yes, where there's, where there's zookeepers, um, zoo trainers, professional trainers. But um, you'll see me doing more live streams as soon as I get back from Key West. I'm heading back to the zoo and starting up a lot of a training. Um, they've already asked me. So what I am training on the left, I had to train her to stay still. Then I had to train her to station. Then I had to train her. What I'm doing right now is when I first, they the vet told me they wanted um, them accepting a noose so they could go in and safely do examinations. So where did I start? What, I, what I'm doing is placing a target stick on their back and getting them used to change. Something's getting ready to happen. You may not know exactly what it is, but if you, you know, we're, we're training them when you stay calm, positive experiences come. So this is how we fed them their their uh, their meals. And so I'm slowly working that target stick up to her mouth so I can safely put a noose on. I just don't want to go ahead and noose them um, because I want them to know um, we respect them and we want this to be as positive as possible for each of them as well. Um, oh, 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 oh. Sorry, Eva. Yeah, okay. Off contact. <laughs> Very funny. We'll do the off contact crate training with Rico starting tomorrow. Okay. Um, so next photo. Um, here is me training Puzzles the Giraffe. I'm getting him ready for something to happen around his rear end. You may not know what it is, but I couldn't. I was like, I need to reinforce being the only one training, peekaboo yourself. That's right, Rocky. That's very, very pretty. You're coming up. Um, <laughs> I can't train fast enough. Um, peekaboo, um, So here is. I'm reinforcing and asking the behavior so my arm, my body's not long enough to do both, so I'm using an extended target stick, um, getting uh, puzzles ready for whatever may happen around her rear end. She's also, or he's also trained to um, accept a bl jugular blood draw, and um, it's been fun. It's been fun. I love training animals because they have fun. Melissa says, level two is worth every dollar. I didn't get any work done this week. I've been watching the videos and listening to the podcast. I've been a member of five days. I've already had my money's worth. Thanks, Melissa. I'm glad you are enjoying it. And hopefully um, you're seeing the benefit of how we can do this with reptiles. And stay, pay attention, Melissa, because when I get back from Key West, we're going to start doing more zoo training in level two. Um, I mean, consistent. So, okay, syringe training with, here's syringe training with Rico. Um, 
the umbrella cockatoo behind me. Um, here I was syringe training Rue, the rat, on our kitchen table. Um, take advantage of, 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 of teaching them things you want them to do at a very young age. Scale training. We train that every animal. Um, I brought the scale in if I can if I can cruise along fast enough because I think there's a lot of importance um, in these photos. This is um, Cello, a roller pigeon. When he came to us, he would fly into the rafters and would have nothing to do with us. Anybody that's been here to the center, Cello laughs. And I always tell people, our roller pigeon can do anything your border collie can do. And those of you guys who've watched our live streams, especially with the training, the difference in the suits of cards, pigeons rock. If you have never trained a pigeon, you must train a pigeon. They are fun, cool, social animals. Um, so, okay, this one's important as well. I'm trying to show you a wide variety of animals and how it can be done. Shelly says, level two rocks. Thank you, Shelly. It's great having you as a member as well as everybody else. Okay, so. Don't pay attention that it's a bird. Just pay attention. Coco! Oh, Coco's on his perch. You know what that means? That means he is wanting me to come in and train him. So one of the things we're doing with Coco now is whenever he goes to his perch, we're letting him train us. We drop what we're doing, run in and train him. So that's our way from keeping him off the ground and reinforcing nesting behaviors. Um, <clears throat> what? So, okay, this is important with Rocky. Rocky will used to be afraid of the vet visit, okay? Look where he is. This is one of our vet techs, uh, Carol, and Rocky loves Carol. So instead of tra training Rocky to accept nail trims, we train him to accept restraint and let the vet, hey guys, let the vet, um, Trim the nails, you're gonna see a series of photos. And then the reinforcer is, he gets to go back to Carol. And Carol is the one restraining him. So, oops, forgot, those are coming up. Um, so you have to train your animal to go to the vet. How are you gonna get it there? You have to train a lot of this stuff. You have to shape it, uh, being calm in different environments. Sandy, go ahead and do what you gotta do. <laughs> um, <clears throat> And how are you going to get there? Is it trained to go up a ramp? Is it trained to go in a crate? Is it trained to stay calm during a car ride? I know with Quincy, our Rottweiler, when she came as a puppy, she showed clear body language. She did not like the car. The car was a cue, and it punished her behavior of walking towards it. So here's me training uh, Ruby to walk up a ramp, go in the back of the Jeep, um, way before it had to happen. Okay, so here's the photos I wanted to get back to. Here's Dr. Myers and Carol restraining Rocky. And this is immediately afterwards. You can see I'm like, attention is a big reinforcer. Clap, tell him what a good boy is. So they will play with him, peekaboo. This is immediately, immediately after the veterinary exam. So I deliver him back to Carol because she is, she's the reinforcer. And then here's Carol delivering intensity of that reinforcer. She gets down on the ground with him. And I can't, can't thank her enough because she keeps that vet experience very positive for him. That is a whole experience. We had to counter condition. Um, yeah, Coco. Okay. So um, does anybody have it? Oh, other people are on here as well that um, use a Dr. Myers as their vet. Um, okay. So... Does anybody have any questions? Because I'm going to end it with, um, I'm getting ready to take off to Key West. And I'll be down there in a couple of weeks. So next week, next Sunday, we're going to have a live stream Q&A. The week after that, I will be live streaming um, from Nancy Forrester's Secret Garden in Key West, Florida. Any of you have followed my search for her? <laughs> Join me. This will be the first time I've seen her in a year. Um, and then as soon as I get back, we're starting our live stream webinars again. I haven't done them in a couple of years. So we're starting off with multiple species. We're going to start off with a parrot, um, but we're going to go into multiple species and in behavior in particular. 
So our first one is March 15th, Teaching Your Bird to Forage. We're already diving deep into foraging in the Parrot Project right now. So uh, um, our parrot-related, our species-specific webinars, live stream webinars, are free to those that are project members. Um, those that are in level two receive every single live stream webinar at no charge. Level one gets behavior webinars at no charge. Parrot Project gets all parrot at no charge. Pig, all pig at no charge. And then back to this workshop, I just told everybody here, I was like, why are we not having an enrichment workshop? Um, a lot of thought goes into our enrichment. Um, this is our first ever enrichment workshop, and um, we all designed it here, showing um, it's going to have several breakout sessions, multiple species, where people are designing their own foraging toys, but I, it's, it's thought going into them. Um, includes, I believe, four lectures from me. Um, what I look for enrichment. Um, how we use enrichment to change behavior, uh, contra freeloading, training as enrichment. And then we're gonna have several different breakout sessions, numerous different animals. Okay. Um, and we're still working on the graphics for this one and we hope to have, um, oh, this one, this one is open up to uh, level one and two and project members now. Open registration for this will be on Wednesday if seats are available. Um, this one, um, we're gonna, uh, myself and Deb, all species training and behavior workshop coming up the second weekend in October. If, you, if you've ever wanted a learning experience, I guarantee you this is gonna be a fabulous one. It's gonna be Dr. Deb Jones, psychologist um, uh, and psychology professor from Kent State University, professional dog trainer. Uh, many people probably know her from Finzi Dog Sports Academy. Her and I are going to be going doing a workshop together. Um, so with that being said, um, anybody wants to find out more about what we do here and the projects and the memberships, um, you can find us at the animalbehaviorcenter.com, our website. And if you want to get in touch with me personally, I answer all my emails. You can find me at laura at the animalbehaviorcenter.com. So people are asking about, is this workshop at the center? Yes, it is. It's here at the center in Sylvania, Ohio. Uh, we have links on where to fly into, how to register, hotel lodging. We're going to have like a, a social meet and greet the day before. And um, are there sessions open in the summer? Sessions. We have workshops booked for the year. Um, so anyways, you can find out more. You're very welcome. Thank you guys for attending. If you like this, if you think this live stream has content that would be beneficial to anybody you know, please feel free to share it. If you have any questions, please feel free to email, to email me. All right? All right. Until next, guy, next week, guys. Hey, guys. Hey, um, Steve, Pat. Um, until next time. We will see you next week. Coffee with the Brothers live stream Q&A. All right. See you guys.